But remember, there are three different ways of translating something from one language into another language. The first way is a literal translation, word for word. This word means this thing. The problem is sometimes when you do that, words don't mean quite the same thing, particularly when there's a meaning. Uh, 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 so if uh, somebody said, uh, I washed my hands of that problem. Now, you could translate that into some other language, but it wouldn't have anything to do with uh, getting your digits clean. Right? So a little translation helps you understand what the original uh, author was saying, but you have to have a knowledge of the, uh, the, the, the language in order to understand it. Another uh, way of translating is what's called a dynamic equivalent, uh, and that's when you say, well, it means this, but it, you know, we're going to translate it into something uh, that, that means essentially the same thing. So to take my uh, wash my hands of it, you might say, I rinse my hair of that. You know, what's the, uh, the old uh, the South Pacific song, I'm going to wash that man right out of my hair, uh, right? Uh, you know, I flushed it, uh, you know, we might say, depending on how crude we want it. Another way uh, uh, is to say a paraphrase. Well, it means this, but what we're actually doing is I got rid of that problem. Now, it doesn't say that in the original language, but that's what it means. Uh, and one of the things, uh, particularly when we're reading poetry, or in this case, when we're reading uh, uh, this, uh, it's not quite poetry, but it's, 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 Oration. It's a it's a spoken uh, uh, act. Uh, you know, it's meant to be heard. It's supposed to to, to get your attention. Uh, it's like a good sermon. Uh, you know, you ever uh, uh, you know roll through the uh, uh, well, nobody rolls through the radio dials anymore. Uh, you ever hit scan on your radio? I uh, don't know. No, we all listen to uh, you know, satellites if you can't get it right. So you hit scan and you know it's, it's going through the things, and all of a sudden you hear somebody who's just on fire preaching, and you stop and listen. It's, it's supposed to get your attention that way. Uh, and so I'm going to read it in, in the, the message, which is the paraphrase uh, translation, paraphrase way of translating, uh, so that we uh, hear it a little bit better that way. Uh, also, although I love the men and women who work on the NIV, they tend to um, gentrify, they, they tend to elevate the language uh, in the biblical text. Uh, uh, because they're good, godly men and women who are thinking about this being read in very proper places, like a church. Um, but the prophets, particularly, are dealing with a culture that is not so proper. And so they use language that sounds a lot more like Donald Trump than we might like uh, and normally get. And, it's, you know, and so, so to get that sort of uh, uh, flavor, uh, I'm reading it from uh, Eugene Peterson's The Message of the Paraphrase. Hosea chapter 4. Attention all Israelites. God's message. God indicts the whole population. No one is faithful. No one loves. No one knows the first thing about God. All this cussing and lying and killing theft and loose sex, sheer anarchy, one murder after another, and because of all this, the very land itself weeps, and everything in it is grief-stricken. Animals in the fields and birds on the wing, even the fish in the sea are listless, lifeless. But don't look for someone to blame. No finger pointing. You priests are the one in the dark. You stumble around in broad daylight, and then the prophets take over and stumble all night. Your mother is as bad as you. My people are ruined because they don't know what's right or true. Because you turned your back on knowledge, I turned my back on you priests. Because you refused to recognize the revelation of God, I'm no longer recognizing your children. The more priests, the more sin. They traded in their glory for shame. They pay out on my people's sins. They can't wait for the latest in evil. The result, 
You can't tell the people from the priests, the priests from the people. I'm on my way to make them both pay and to take consequences of the bad lives they've lived. They'll eat and be as hungry as ever, have sex and get no satisfaction. They walked out on me, their God, for a life of running with whores. Wine and whiskey leave my people in a stupor. They ask questions of a dead tree, expect answers from a sturdy walking stick. Drunk on sex, they can't find their way home. They replace their God with their genitals. They worship on the tops of mountains, make a picnic out of religion. Under the oaks and elms on the hills, they stretch out and take it easy. Before you know it, your daughters are whores, and the wives of your sons are sleeping around. But I'm not going after your whoring daughters or the adulterous wives of your sons. It's the men who pick up the whores that I'm after. The men who worship at the holy whorehouses. A stupid people ruined by whores. You've ruined your own life, Israel. But don't drag Judah down with you. Don't go to the set shrine at Gilgal. Don't go to that sin city, Bethel. Don't go around saying God bless you and not mean it, taking God's name in vain. Israel is stubborn as a mule. How can God lead him like a lamb to open pasture? Ephraim is addicted to idols. Let him go. When the beer runs out, it's sex, sex, and more sex. Bold and sordid debauchery, how they love it. The whirlwind has them in its clutches. Their sex worship leaves them finally impotent. May the Lord bless the reading of his word and guide my mouth I speak the message by prepared that it be his message, not mine. That he might receive more and honor than God. That all those with ears might hear the words of the Lord. Tweeted that out in 140 characters, it would uh, get some attention, wouldn't it? It, uh, it, it gets you going. Hmm. It's not just a little sit down and let's read this and uh, feel warm and fuzzy about our lives. <coughs> Hosea is angry. He's delivering a word against the people who are are going astray. He's speaking this against an entire culture. From the very uh, wealthiest one percent, all the way down to the poorest among them, there is corruption. There is idolatry. There is adultery. There is a sin-sick culture. So he's addressing it. It's a culture that when we we think we we, we read this, we go maybe maybe this isn't quite Vermont. I mean, you know, we're we're delinquent. Subdued around here. Think about it. <coughs> Verse 7, we have a, an interesting uh, a, a note. Uh, it says, You exchanged your glorious God in the NIV, or your glory for shame. That's my sermon title this morning. Glory for shame. Anybody from mother ever say, For shame. Glory for shame. The, the text note says that uh, it's following a, a Syriac uh, translation. Uh, earlier, the, that's in the 2011, and the 2000, uh, or, or the 1978 version of the NIV, it's, they exchanged their glory uh, for, for shameful things. Uh, uh, whether or not it's glory or a glorious God, uh, what they're exchanging is an interesting uh, thing. Like I said, there's the two different uh, textual trans, uh, traditions, and so the 2011 is gone. God. They're exchanging their glorious God for these other gods, these other things, these shameful things. It's a lovely text to, to read and think about what it is that, or a striking text, I should say, not lovely, uh, to, to, to think about what it is that we give up for, for, for what we gain. How we go through our lives giving one thing over another because we can't do everything. We can't hold on to everything. We have to exchange certain things for other things. What's the saying? Time is money. Right? Many of us spend our lives and we exchange 
uh, time for money. We, we go to a job, we punch in, we punch out, and uh, you know, when it says, oh, we worked uh, you know, 17 hours in a row, we get so many dollars uh, for that time. Some of us, uh, you know, the past couple of weeks have been exchanging time in the woods for fresh venison. Not, not me, I've just been exchanging time in the woods for cold toes. <coughs> I've been looking at trees that are going to get cut down soon and thinking about, okay, let's see, if that tree is that big, then there's so many more feet of uh, lumber in it, and so then I'm going to get so much money out of it. Forget the deer and the antlers. <coughs> that, that's, a, that's a lovely blessing that I've got. We have to, to look and say, okay, I'm going to exchange uh, you know, uh, getting a great deal on a, a, a big screen TV for spending a little more time with Grandma. Because maybe there's not all that much time left to spend with her. Every one of you made an exchange this morning when you decided to come to church instead of do whatever else you want to do. Maybe it was get a little bit extra nap. I know some of you are getting your extra nap now. Um, you, know, you didn't want to sleep late, but you figured you could sleep in church. You're just meditating. It's okay. You start snoring, old nudge it. You made a decision, a conscious decision, that it would be better for your soul to be in church than to be someplace else and doing something else. The people that Hosea is speaking to are exchanging their glorious relationship with God for false promises with idols. And it looks like Las Vegas. It looks like, you know, pick, pick your place of, uh, of vice, your city built out of vice, Atlantic City. Uh, it looks bad. In verse 10, you get this lovely contrast. You see, they're seeking one thing and they're getting the opposite. This is the way you know that this culture is sick that it's diseased, that it's insane. What's the old uh, definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again, <coughs> expecting a different result. They're doing the same thing over and over again, and they're expecting something different from it. They're having their feasts, it says, but they're not satisfied. I don't know if the nation has a, a major holiday where the, the highlight of that holiday is to get together and eat as much food as they possibly can and then eat a little more foods that are incredibly labor intensive like pies and turkeys and they eat and eat and eat and then when they get done their inclination is to go out and spend an awful lot of money. Maybe it's a sickness. Says they will feast but still want more of that scene, uh, the condemning scene in uh, the Hunger Games, right? Where uh, the, the, the heroine Katniss is there in, in the city and they have all the foods in front of them. She's come from this place where they're starving uh, uh, and they say, Yes, we eat so much, and then we just take this little thing and it makes us grow up, so there's more room for us to eat. We don't do that. We just shift. We go from eating when we can't fit any more pie in to let's see what deals I can get on a laptop. <coughs> we just want more and more and more. We change the players. It says you will have much sex, but you will have no satisfaction. That's how you know uh, uh, Peterson is channeling uh, Mick Jagger, right? I can't get uh, no, not uh, uh, not Mick Jagger. Uh, can't get no satisfaction. Help me out, Big Jack. Big Jack, okay, well, that's right. Don't, don't mind that the pastor on those uh, is up there. <coughs> right? What does he say? But they'll have no satisfaction. Think about uh, a sex saturated culture where every moment you're bombarded with images of sex, where, where every sort of 
activity is endorsed and celebrated, and yet there's a declining birth rate. And yet where relationships are so hard to come by. I was at a, a store the other day, uh, a restaurant, and this uh, obviously elderly uh, couple came in, and uh, she went and sat down and sort of hobbled over, sat down at the table across from me, and, and, uh, uh, and then uh, about uh, you know, 10 minutes later, her husband came hobbling over and uh, brought the food that he had ordered uh, for both of them. I said, isn't it lovely uh, that you guys have been married for so long uh, that you know what, uh, that you, you know, you, the husband, can order for her? And he said, well, you've been married 65 years. I get what she tells me to get. <laughs> 65 years of marriage. That's a long time. It's an increasing rarity in our cultures. Man and I went to a wedding once where we were the people who had been married the longest. People who were getting married, neither of their parents were still married, none of their grandparents were still married. Jack Daniels, you gotta go through. 
You know, here we put them on the interstates. Here we put them in grocery stores. Here we put them all over the place. Big signs. Just something a little bit different. But the spirit is the same. Spirits? No. The idea about seeking after your own pleasure. That's what it means to make your genitals your God. What tickles your fancy? becomes the thing that you want. What Paul says in, in, in end days, men will seek things and women will seek things that tickle their ears. You see, the people are going after what makes them feel good. And they're ignoring the fact that it doesn't amount to anything. That all that pleasure, all that, that warm, fuzzy feelings goes away. And they're left feeling See, I think in, in New England we, we have that, that same desire to, to have our, our de or we have that same inclination to have our desires tickled, to have our desires satisfied. We just don't tend to do that, you know, out in public. One pastor, a friend of mine, says that uh, New Englanders uh, uh, repent the same way they sin, in private with little fanfare. We don't make a big show about it. We're not going to go out to, to some, some place and celebrate and you know, make it rain. No, we'll just sit away at our homes. We repent that same way. We, we don't have big altar calls. We don't have uh, uh, you know, big uh, you know, moments where 10,000 people or 20 people come up and pray here and let's, uh, let's repent of our sins. No, we'll, we'll read a sign and, and we'll, we'll go home and we'll think about it and we'll pray that prayer. Pastor friend of mine, a different pastor friend of mine, said that when he came to faith, he was about 12. And uh, his church, like many churches, had, had transitioned multiple pastors. And years later, he met his, uh, his old pastor and said, you know, you, your sermons and your preaching led me to faith. And the guy said, well, why didn't you tell me, Dave? I didn't know that. I thought I was doing all that ministry work and no fruits were showing whatsoever for all that labor. And he said, I didn't know it was something that you told other people that you didn't come to faith in Jesus. Just you know, did it. Moved on. See, it's that, that privateness that we get. Think about the fact that, that the, the drug that we tend to overdose, our culture overdoses on, is heroin. It's not ecstasy. We're not going to big parties, taking all sorts of things, and then dying, you know, like they are in some parts of the world, in some parts of the country. We have folks, you know, most of them got hooked on prescription drugs, right? A little private interaction between them and their doctor, and, you know, eventually they uh, move on uh, from one opiate to another. They die someplace with a needle in their arm, all alone. We're private people. But that doesn't mean we don't have that same, same drive to, to have what we want, what our pleasure, what our joy is, be the, the rule, be the motivation. Sometimes when I'm talking to other pastors, I, I tell them about our town, 1,374 people. That's how many people live in Cavendish, according to my census. We probably up and down a little bit, but 1,374 people. 900 of them in Proctorsville, 400 of them in Cavendish, Proctor. 1,374 people, five churches. I have to say, that having five churches in a population of 1,374 people, I don't think is a sign of how incredibly spiritual and religious our community is. <coughs> no, I think it has to do more with uh, a desire that it's more important to have a church exactly the way that we want. Because each one of them is a little bit different. Each one of them serves a little bit different niche. But we want what we want. We want it the way we like it. And so rather than, than, than give that up, if we have to struggle, we'll struggle and keep our little vision alive.
patients uh, with some folks. We'll call them Jack and Jill because it's a small community. So if I use their real names or any other descriptions, you know what I was talking about. You probably will know what I'm talking about anyway, but it applies to a few more than two people. Talking to Jack and Jill, both of them used to come to our church for a while and now don't. I asked Jack, well, why don't you go to this church? And he said, well, Jill goes there, and I don't like her and don't get along with her and her family, so I, I don't go to your church anymore. I had a conversation with Jill. I said, Jill, why don't you come to church anymore? Well, I don't get along with Jack and his family, and you know, he's got some things that I don't like and said some things about me, and so I'm not going to go to your church anymore.
Some pieces are missing. Some of it they're glued back together and the edges are irregular. Instead of a unified whole, instead of a tradition that says, look at how we've always managed to come together and be united as a family, you be united as a people of God. Instead of that, it's pieces. And oh yeah, there's a piece over here and there's a piece that went to our cousin over here and so and so, you know. How many of you, uh, you know, when you, have the, when you have the abundance swap, if there's a puzzle that's at the abundance swap and it says, only missing a few pieces. Oh, let me take that home. You know, better yet, uh, you know, when I was a mover, we used to say, well, now your 32 piece china set is a 3,000 piece china set. Only missing, you know, here's a box of china. See? Shake, 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 shake. Only missing a few pieces out of every plate. <clears throat> see, when I look out at our church, I see some people who are missing. I see some Jacks and Jills. When I look at, at the, the community, the Church of God in Cavendish, I see some Jacks and Jills. We don't go to church anymore because so and so go. When I look out at you, I see some Jacks and Jills. Maybe you're still you're a little more stubborn than your Jill or your Jack the uh, 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 compatriot. No, that's not right. Companion. So you still go to church, but you chase so and so out because they're just weird, or they just do this thing. <coughs> Instead of exchanging something glorious and unified, instead of exchanging something beautiful, instead of exchanging a relationship that you have with God that should be the thing that unites you to someone else, as a brother and sister in Christ, instead of exchanging that glorious reality for something shameful, Your genital God, your pleasure God, your stomach God, your desires that you've made into an idol. Instead, we should come to the cross of Jesus Christ. We should bring our shameful past and present. We should bring our sins and failings. And we should give them over. We should receive the love and forgiveness that God has promised to those who love Him and exchange that pile of... See, I'm not a prophet of Israel, so I'm not going to use the language that they would. Exchange that pile of stuff your life.